You know, over the years, a lot of people come up to us and ask us about our music. Where does it come from? I don't rightly know what to tell them. And you know a lot of the same people that ask us about our music? Well, they'll tell us that, that our music has the sound of the ages, the lonesomeness of the mountains. <laughs> Me? I always just thought of it as a gift. Oh, I don't know. It's a lot of things, I guess. But you know, some of the first music we ever heard was back when we was little boys. Going to the McClure Primitive Baptist Church. Well, well that's right. Come on in here. I, I want you folks to see this. I want you folks to hear this. Now, now I don't know how much a lot of you folks know about the, the little Baptist churches we have back in the mountains. Or like the ones we went to. But a lot of them, they don't allow any musical instruments in the church. No guitars, pianos, organs. Just the human voice. Why that is, I don't know. Some sort of tradition, I guess. But they'll have a singer or song leader to, to get up in front of the congregation and, and lead the whole flock of people through a song, through a hymn, one line at a time, line by line, till they get the whole thing done. Well, in fact, that's what we call that kind of singing, lining out. Well, one of the song leaders will start off with something like... Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And then the congregation would follow right along behind him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And back to the song leader. That saved a wretch like me. That saved and... <laughs> so on and so forth. And a lot of these singers and song leaders, oh, they have such a lyrical way about their singing. And even their talking, too, same way. Lyrical. <laughs> you could almost taste the smell of wood smoke in them voices. So I'd say that's a little bit of what our music's are rooted in. And, and you know, growing up in the church like that, well, well, I like to think I turned out what folks today might call spiritual. Oh, I'd read and study on all this stuff, and, well, I'd write songs about it. I, I surely would. But you know, as much as I would read and study on all this stuff and write songs about it, I have an independent streak about me. Ha <laughs> ha! I like to kick back and rebel every now and again. Well, I remember one time we was coming back from a show date somewhere. Oh, it was dark. Late at night. There was a storm coming up. Pretty bad one, too. Lots of thunder and lightning. And the old boy that was driving the car for us that night, it had him shook up pretty bad. It didn't bother me any. I just rolled down the car window, stuck my fist up in the air and hollered, You think you can get me? Come on! Ha 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 ha! There ain't nobody or no thing gets the better of Carter Stanley. And that's the way it was when I took my first drink. Oh, just like religion was growing up, it was all around us. And we had an uncle that made some of the finest moonshine whiskey around. Well, after we got to traveling the roads, going to show dates and one thing and another, well, about any time we'd be driving off the ridge, I'd have him to stop and pull the car over so I could get me some of what we called Dewey's Finest. <laughs> and it was, too. If the ocean was a whiskey and I was a duck, ha ha, I'd dive to the bottom and never come up. Of course, when you're a young buck and feeling invincible, well, well, a drink here and there, especially on a Saturday night, well, well, that don't hurt nothing. Later on, you get to traveling the roads away from home. Well, a dose or two, I, I call it my medicine. That just helps the miles to go by it a little easier. And Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And a shot or two before you put you on a program, well, well that just steadies your nerves. It, it puts your mind at ease. Well, you all know what I'm talking about. Or do you? On bended knees, 
knees I prayed a prayer that God would save and protect us there. Let whiskey stay as far from me as the mountain is from the deep blue sea. Well, in case a lot of you folks hasn't figured it out by now, we was kindly raised up on hillbilly music. And to me, that's not a dirty word. Well, we listen to folks like the Carter family, Mainers Mountaineers, the Monroe Brothers. And after Bill and Charlie Monroe kindly split up and went their own separate ways, well, well then there was Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. We used to listen to him on Saturday nights when, when he'd be on the Grand Old Opry from Nashville, Tennessee. And as soon as we got to hearing the kind of music Bill was making with his group, we knew right then and there that that was the sound for us. Mandolins and fiddles, guitars and banjos, them's the kind of instruments Bill used to make his music. And them's the same kind of instruments we used to make our music. Of course, it's not just the instruments, it's what you do with them. It's the rhythm and the drive and the power and the punch. That's what makes this kind of music. Now, Pee Wee Lambert was a feller that understood all of this. Oh, back when we first started our group back in 1946, well, well Pee Wee was an original member of the group. And, and Pee Wee, <laughs> his given name was Daryl, but he, he's kind of a short little feller, and somebody hung the name Pee Wee on him. He, he could play the mandolin and pitch his voice just as high and clear, just like Bill Monroe. Well, you know, before Bill Monroe come along, no, nobody would hardly ever heard any kind of music like this. Somebody once called it the folk music with overdrive. Oh, that all the music just come a, a roaring at you like an express train. And I'm proud to tell you that after Bill Monroe, we was the second group to ever try to pick and sing this kind of music. And the feller that helped to shape it that way, Pee Wee Lambert. Now, 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 back when we first started out, back in 1946, we, we was kindly in the old-time hillbilly vein. Oh, the first couple of records we ever made, that's what they was, old-time hillbilly music. But we'd listen to Bill Monroe when he'd be on the Opry on Saturday nights. And if Bill had him a new song, maybe one we'd never heard him do before, we'd all gather around the radio extra close, and we'd all try to copy down the words as best we could, and... Well, after Bill's program would go off the air, we'd all get together and piece it together. And Well, come Monday at noontime when it was time for our Farm and Fun Time program on WCYB in Bristol, well, well Bill Monroe's new song from Saturday night would be a new song on our program. And we got real excited when we heard Bill do this one song about this famous horse race. It took place about 100 years ago out in Louisville, Kentucky. And they named the song after the two horses in the race, Molly in Tenbrooks. And you should have heard the way Bill done it on the Opry. Had that fancy banjo picking and that sky high tenor singing and mandolin playing and well we got so excited about it we decided to go in the studio and make us a record of it. And it was kind of a group thing. I mean we had all the boys picking on it and everything but well we kind of put Pee Wee out front and center on it. Had him playing the mandolin and singing sky high and clear just like Bill Monroe. Now, we didn't know if Bill would like it or not. <laughs> as soon as the record come out and folks got to hearing it on the radio, <laughs> ooh, ooh <wee. laughs> you, you know, it used to be years ago if, uh, if you heard a hillbilly record on the radio, well, well, you knew within the first two or three notes whether it was going to be a, a Roy A. Cuff or an Ernest Tubb. They, well, they all had a style about them, so, something unique. Something that, uh, something that would make folks want to come out and see them when uh, they would bring their program around to different parts of the country. And Bill Monroe was no different, but Bill Monroe had him a style. And when he heard us doing that song, the way that he done it, oh, he wasn't pleased a bit. Oh, it got so whenever anybody would mention the Stanley Brothers around Bill Monroe, he saw red. <laughs> But that didn't last long, and we, we patched things up with him. And Well, in fact, I went to work for him. I sure did. 
things was kindly slow with our group at the time. The Korean War was heating up, and Uncle Sam kept calling on members of our band to go overseas and shoot bullets at people. So we took a little time off. I went to work for Bill Monroe, stayed with him three or four months, traveled all over the country with him, played on, the, played on some records with him, and uh, even played on the stage of the Grand Old Opry. Made me real proud when Bill would mention my name on the stage of the Grand Old Opry. Now, we'd like to call up one of the Bluegrass Boys to help me do a little number here. One of the finest fellas to ever stand beside of me on a stage and hold a guitar. And a fellow that has one of the best natural lead voices that I've ever heard in my life. Of course, I'm talking about Mr. Carter Stanley. Carter, you get up here now and help me do this little number now. When did we just have recorded called the Sugar Coated Love? <laughs> Bill Monroe called my name on the stage of the Grand Old Opry. <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better friend than Bill Monroe. I couldn't ask for a better friend than Pee Wee Lambert. Oh, Pee Wee stayed with us four or five years. Helped us get going in that, that bluegrass direction. Helped us make the records and... Well, after we'd had two or three of them to come out, we, we wanted to come up with a sound of our own. Well, something that was still like Bill's music, but something we could put our own spin on. We'd done it with our trio singing. Y you know, it used to be if a group of hillbillies wanted to do them a trio, well, they'd gang around the microphone, and one of the boys, usually the guitar player, well, well he would put the lead, the melody out, put it right smack dab out there in the middle. One of the other boys would add a harmony up above it, the tenor, and, well, the last piece of the puzzle would be the baritone. So you'd have lead, tenor, baritone. That was your standard trio. Well, we wanted to shake it up a little bit. Oh, we still put the lead and the tenor out there, but, well, instead of leaving the baritone buried way underneath there, we, we kind of yanked it out and stuck it way up on top, made a whole new part out of it. And because it was pitched so high and clear like that, well, the perfect person to sing it was Pee Wee Lambert. And you should have heard some of the records we'd done that way. The Lonesome River, The Fields of Turn Brown, The White Dove. That was the sound. But we didn't get rich off of it, and, well, neither did Pee Wee. After he'd had uh, two or three youngins to come along, well, he needed to make him an honest living. But I loved that boy. And about any time we'd be up in his part of the country where he and his family settled down, well, well, we'd stop in for a visit, catch up on old times and swap stories. And <laughs> well, Pee Wee passed away not long ago. Forty years old. Heart attack. Of course, early on, he, he, he was more than just my singing partner. Uh, he's my drinking buddy. <laughs> oh, his wife Hazel used to get after us. She, she'd say, how do you boys stand to hold your beer like that? I told her, Hazel, we don't hold it. We drink it. <laughs> Pee-wee's dead. His wife Hazel was going through his wallet not long after he passed away. Little scraps of paper in one thing and another, and she she come across the one piece that was folded up in there that well, well the old '78 records we used to have years ago, the, the 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 big round disc that had one song on one side and one song on the other, and and right smack in the middle of them they would have this paper label that was stuck on them would would give the name of the song and who was singing it in one thing and another. Well, somehow or another, Pee Wee had, had took and, and worked off the label of one of these 78s and, and folded it up and carried it in his wallet all those years. Hazel opened it up, and it was the label off of that first bluegrass record we ever made, that, that Molly and Tenbrooks, the, the one where we had Pee Wee out front and center on it. The music meant something.
Pee-wee meant something to me. Our good friend, Dr. Mongol, came to pay us a visit not long ago. Stayed three or four days with us, and while he was there, he gave me a little checkup. A good going over. When he was done, he told me, uh, said, if I didn't make some changes, I guess he was talking about me and Dewey's finest, talking about my drinking, said, if I didn't make some changes, I wouldn't be around to see another Christmas. I told him, just like I told you folks a while ago, there ain't nobody or no thing gets the better of Carter Stanley. I told him, I said, I'll be a wrong time after you cross the river, Doc. Pee-wee's dead. And what did he leave behind? The, the songs? The music? Makes me think about our music. My music. You know, we took it to 42 different states, seven foreign countries, made over 150 songs and over 300 recordings, and had one of them in the top 20. But it's been a hell of a ride for a country boy from the hills, from the Clinch Mountains of Virginia and around the world. And back home again. Will you miss me? Will you miss me? Will you miss me? Will you miss me? When I'm gone